You are a living organism. That's obvious, right? But this simple fact actually explains one of the most profoundly important aspects of your life, your emotions. More importantly, it can help you to control your emotions. Now, this is important because we define the quality of our lives by our emotional experience. We agonize in fear, anxiety, and despair because we don't know how our emotions work or how to regulate them. Yet, if we can twist the dials of our own brains in the right way, we can learn to temper our negative emotions and amplify the positive ones and enjoy life more. But this raises a central question. When it comes to emotions, why does our status as biological organisms matter so much? As an organism, there are many physiological measures that you have to keep within relatively narrow ranges unless you want to die or get very sick. So if your glucose levels get too low, your organs will eventually stop working too high and your kidneys will eventually fail. Similarly, you need to drink enough water, but not so much that you remove all the salt from your cells. There are many other measures like this that require the same kind of balance. In general, this is called homeostasis. All organisms must maintain homeostasis, including each of the trillions of individual cells in your body. For example, if a cell is running low on glucose, a series of chemical reactions inside the cell causes it to express a protein that acts as a channel through which glucose in the bloodstream can enter the cell. While the details of this mechanism are complex, it's still a relatively simple mechanism. For example, consider what happens when you, like the cell, start feeling hungry. Do you just trigger the expression of a protein that sucks sugar in from the surrounding environment directly into your body? No, of course not. First, you probably think about how you can get food, what kind of food you have access to, what you should or shouldn't eat, and so on. Then you make a plan. And finally, you walk across the street to the cafe and maybe get a bagel. At the molecular level, this is insanely complex, involving countless biochemical pathways that together allow you to feel, think, and act. What's interesting about this series of events is that it began with a feeling. Right? a sensation in your body which your brain interpreted as hunger. Hunger is an example of what some scientists call a homeostatic emotion. Other examples include pain, thirst, nausea, and sleepiness. Now, homeostatic emotions motivate you to take action to alleviate the aversive sensations that accompany them, whether that means buying food, filling your water bottle, taking an antacid, or going to sleep. The feelings of hunger, pain, thirst, and so on are aimed at re-establishing homeostasis in your body. But this raises two important questions. First, how does the body tell the brain that it's been knocked out of homeostasis? And second, what do homeostatic emotions have to do with real emotions, like joy, anger, fear, and love? Let's address each of these questions in turn. If you inject a rat with a certain protein from an E. coli bacteria, the rat will react as if it's very sick. The protein itself is actually harmless, but the rat's immune system reacts as if it's a real bacterial infection, which leads to inflammation throughout the body. The rat will also look like it's sick. It'll move slower and won't socialize as much. You might think that's because the inflammation is somehow gumming up the rat's body, like when motor oil sludge accumulates in an engine and causes it to overheat and break down. But that's not really what's happening. Let's say that before you inject the rat, you inactivate a specific nerve running from the internal organs up to the brain known as the vagus nerve. In this case, you would observe something very different. While the immune system would be doing the same thing as before, the rat would not show any sickness behavior. That's because sickness behaviors are a product of the brain. If you inactivate the vagus nerve, the brain is less able to receive the body's message that it's sick. So the brain just goes on like nothing happened. Now the vagus nerve, in addition to a few other nerves, carry interoceptive information to the brain. And this information is first gathered by receptors throughout the body. Now these receptors are attached to nerves, including the vagus nerve, that send information to the spinal cord or directly to the brain. One of these pathways goes from the visceral organs to the spinal cord, to the brainstem, then to a region of the brain called the thalamus. The second pathway goes from the visceral organs directly to the thalamus. Now what's important is that the interoceptive information goes from the body to the thalamus, regardless of which pathway it takes. The thalamus acts as a brain's relay station and filter for all kinds of sensory information. It determines which area of the brain should receive which type of information. 
interoceptive information is sent to the primary interoceptive cortex, which is in an area of the brain called the posterior insular cortex, or simply the posterior insula. This region then sends this information forward to an area known as the anterior insula. In general, the insula is responsible for your conscious perception, the, the feeling of the internal sensations of your body. So this is how your brain learns about what is happening in your body. The benefit of interoception is that it allows the brain to be aware of what's happening in the body and to adjust the physiology so as to maintain homeostasis. To accomplish this, the insular cortex works with areas like the anterior cingulate cortex to influence the thalamus, hypothalamus, and brainstem in order to modulate heart rate, sweating, immune responses, digestion, and so on. The prefrontal cortex helps regulate these processes by exerting top-down control. And this allows for some degree of conscious modulation of physiological states, like when you, for example, consciously change your breathing rate. Okay, I know this is a ton of neuroscientific detail, but the main takeaway is that there is a bi-directional connection. The body and brain are in constant conversation, working together to make careful micro-adjustments to physiological parameters. Now, if you want a much more thorough treatment of interoception, check out my video called Discussing the Neurobiology of Interoception and Affect. Still, to make sure that you've got the main takeaways of this section, let's quickly summarize it. So interoception is the sense of what's happening inside the body, and it's sensed by receptors on internal organs that detect homeostatic changes. Interoceptive information can take either a direct or indirect pathway to the thalamus, which is the brain's relay station and filter for sensory information. The thalamus then sends this information to the insula, which is responsible for conscious perception of internal bodily sensations. And this allows the brain to be aware of what's happening in the body and adjust physiology accordingly. All this might seem like a physiology lesson. So what does this actually have to do with emotions? So in everyday life, we use the terms emotion and feeling interchangeably. But in science, these terms are actually distinct. A feeling is a consciously perceived sensation of the body. For example, the feeling of your heart pounding in your chest, a pain in your stomach, or maybe a warm, pleasurable sensation throughout your body, or the heavy feeling of fatigue. So for the purposes of this video, think of a feeling as a kind of introceptive percept, a feeling of the body. Emotion, on the other hand, is more complex. Scientists disagree about the exact definition of emotion, and there are at least three major schools of thought with a spirited debate among them. And I don't wanna get bogged down by this debate, although I've done a whole video on that topic, which you can watch if you're interested. Instead, I wanna offer my own tentative definition, which is based largely on kind of personal experience, but which I think is compatible with dictionary definitions of emotion, as well as the views of many affective scientists. So it seems to me that emotions are feelings intertwined with thoughts, such that the feeling and the thought form a single experience. When you're angry, for example, you experience not only an unpleasant burning sensation, but also a thought that seems to either explain, drive, or amplify the feeling. When you're excited, you don't just feel good, but you're also thinking about some future thing that you're anticipating a positive outcome from. So in this way, emotions are always about something, whether that something is more diffuse or more specific, or it's only in our minds, or it really is out there in the world. So emotions are a kind of thought-feeling hybrid. Now let's quickly define what thoughts are and what thinking is so we can really understand this. Now the American Psychological Association says that thinking includes imagining, remembering, problem solving, daydreaming, free association, concept formation, and many other processes. In a previous video, I talked about the large-scale networks involved in the various types of thinking, like the default mode network and the frontoparietal control system. So again, emotions are feelings and thoughts linked into a kind of holistic experience. Again, if you're motivated, joyful, and enthusiastic, and I ask you to describe what that feels like in your body, you might say it's like a lightness in your chest or an energetic sensation throughout your body or a diffuse, maybe mildly pleasurable vibration. Whatever the precise language you use to describe it, you would not say that it feels painful or sickening. On the other hand, you might use exactly those words if I were to ask you to describe how you feel when you witness an act of cruelty or when you're experiencing grief. 
But why? Why do we experience visceral sensations when we experience emotions? Okay, remember that you are a biological organism that must maintain homeostasis to survive. Hunger pains and sleepiness motivate behaviors that rapidly restore homeostasis, namely by eating and sleeping. As complex organisms, we are not stimulus response machines that just seek to maximize momentary pleasure and minimize pain. Instead, we act toward the future, even if that means going through an even worse homeostatic state in the interim. For example, when you get hungry, you probably don't just eat whatever happens to be in your immediate vicinity. If all you have in your pantry is a bag of flour, I doubt that you start tearing into it and choking down the dry powder, even though that would be the fastest way to remedy your departure from homeostasis. Instead, you might make the flour into something more palatable, like bread, or you might go and buy a snack at the store, for example. Even though you'd be hungrier by the time the bread was made or the snack was bought, you'd be happy to go through this even deeper departure of homeostasis if it meant avoiding the unpleasant sensations of eating a bag of dry flour. Now, as an example of how this principle applies to you know, real emotions, say you're going to the store to buy that snack. Right? As you approach the register though, three hooded figures burst through the door with guns drawn, pointing them at customers and the cashier. Most of us would be terrified in this situation. Our whole body and brain would be telling us to stay put, hide, try to escape, or quietly call the police, and for good reason. If you were to ignore your feelings and casually approach the register, seemingly oblivious to the gunman, you would be putting yourself in serious danger. This seems obvious to anyone, but it requires a great deal of prediction by the brain. It's about your chances of getting injured or getting killed that go up if you just go about your business as usual. Your brain is predicting that it will be better for your well-being to stay put or possibly fight back if you have the means to do so. You feel unpleasant visceral sensations in your body as a kind of warning system to stop you from doing anything stupid. It's almost like your brain is saying, you think these feelings are bad? This is just a taste of what's to come if you try to go buy that snack right now. Now, some neuroscientists, like the late Jak Pongsep, believe that you're afraid because your understanding of this situation as life-threatening triggers a subcortical brain circuit, including the amygdala and others, that makes you feel afraid and more likely to fight, flee, or freeze. Now, others, like Lisa Feldman Barrett, argue that you're afraid in this situation because your brain has constructed the category of fear by lumping together perceptually similar instances of this experience and that this particular experience fits into that category. Okay, so what about positive emotions? How could these prediction processes possibly be related to homeostasis when it comes to positive emotions? All right, let's say you've just eaten the perfect sized meal with perfect proportions of vegetables, proteins, and carbs, and now your sympathetic nervous system is going full blast. It's slowing your heart rate, relaxing your pupils, and engaging the digestive system. Now, if you were to describe what that feels like, what would you say? Again, I can guess that you would not say that it makes you feel nauseous, right? Instead, you'd use phrases like pleasantly full or others indicating a greater or lesser degree of pleasure in your body. It might be mild, but it would most likely feel good. From a biological perspective, it's not hard to see why satiation would activate pleasure networks in your brain. Even if you didn't particularly like the taste of the food, your interoceptive system would recognize that you'd undergone a positive homeostatic change. Now, thanks to that improvement, your brain's pleasure networks, working closely alongside the dopamine system, would make you more likely to engage in that behavior in the future. Now, let's think about a positive emotion that seems far removed from physiology, like say the joy of learning. So learning can be challenging and sometimes downright grueling, but once you come to understand something, there's a kind of light bulb moment that feels good. There's pleasant feelings associated with it. Learning is typically associated with the activation of the mesolimbic dopamine pathway as well as pleasure-related brain regions. But why would gathering more information be associated with positive visceral feelings? Because your brain is predicting, whether consciously or not, the homeostatic benefits you might receive. So if you learn to drive, for example, you can spend less time and energy getting where you need to go. More abstractly, if you learn that your gut is filled with microorganisms, 
you can find ways of tending to the health of your microbiome. Now, it's not that every bit of learning will definitely lead to homeostatic improvements, but your brain is doing a statistical calculation where the likelihood of receiving such benefits is high, right? Your brain could be mistaken about this, but the positive feelings associated with the joy of learning are a reflection of that prediction. They're also likely a reflection of your unique brain. Not everyone enjoys learning as much as others, but you've probably learned to enjoy learning thanks to the statistical likelihood that you'll gain some future benefit from it. Finally, I wanna stress that this calculation is largely unconscious, and it's likely driven by a convoluted chain of associations and sometimes erroneous statistical predictions. Thus, we can love things that ultimately hurt us, which tragically happens in many abusive relationships. We can fear things that would ultimately help us, such as when we're lonely, but we repeatedly stop ourselves from trying to make friends because we fear rejection. In general, when we inaccurately evaluate what is good or bad for us, we tend to suffer emotionally. Earlier, I said that emotions are feelings intertwined with thoughts, such that the feeling and thought seem to form a single coherent experience. This gives you two fundamental routes to regulating emotion, thought and feeling. So thought-based or cognitive emotion regulation strategies are some of the best studied, largely because they seem to work very well. Let's look at three different strategies and when they might work most effectively. First, cognitive reframing. This strategy involves changing the way you think about an emotionally charged situation. Imagine you're frustrated because a colleague didn't complete their part of a project on time. Instead of jumping to conclusions, consider that they might be dealing with personal issues or maybe an unexpected workload. When you're facing a setback, like not getting a promotion at work, reinterpret it as an opportunity to develop new skills or seek a role that you might be better suited to. This approach works best when there are multiple plausible perspectives on a situation. Right, you don't wanna just make up totally implausible perspectives, you want it to be realistic. Now second, writing about your emotions. Writing about emotions can help you express and process them, which can often lead to a more positive state. If, for example, you find yourself ruminating over a heated argument with someone, try writing about what you feel and why you feel that way. Writing is a form of thinking, and fully thinking through your emotions can often help you find a sense of peace. Okay, third, acceptance. Sometimes the best approach is to just accept your emotions without judgment. Acceptance involves acknowledging your feelings without trying to change them. This strategy can be particularly effective when dealing with emotions that are persistent or are tied to circumstances beyond your control. For example, if you're grieving the loss of a loved one, Right? Accepting your sadness as part of the natural healing and grieving process can be more helpful than trying to force yourself to feel better. Okay, the second set of emotion regulation strategies are what I call feelings-based strategies. Feelings-based strategies can be effective, especially when the emotion feels overwhelming and you need some space from it. They can also be effective when the emotion doesn't seem to be about anything in particular, kind of a low mood or like when you're just feeling sad and can't identify why. First, exercise. Exercise can rapidly change your physiology, which can have a powerful effect on the feeling associated with an emotion. For example, exercise releases molecules like endorphins and endocannabinoids that just make you feel good. It also shifts your attention from the emotion to the workout itself. Second, breath work. Say you're feeling overwhelmed and anxious about a looming deadline. Taking a few minutes to practice a deep breathing exercise can help you regain composure and focus. The podcaster and neuroscientist Andrew Huberman has talked a lot about one called the physiological sigh, which is very useful for calming anxious feelings. To do it, take a double inhale through your nose and then slowly exhale through your mouth until your lungs are empty. I know that seems impossibly simple, but try it, it can really help. In my experience, another technique known as the Wim Hof method can invigorate you and kind of calm your mind simultaneously, which is super useful when you're feeling both tired and anxious. I actually used this method before my wedding to help me stay calm as well as focused while reading my vows. Okay, the next strategy is eating. 
So sometimes low blood sugar can contribute to emotional distress. Eating a nutritious snack can help stabilize your mood in that case. This points to a messy overlap, right, between the interoceptive and emotional feelings where our brains can become confused about the source of dissatisfaction, whether it's physiological or cognitive. Now, when it comes to regulating emotions, there's no single perfect strategy. It's likely that a combination of cognitive and feelings-based strategies will be more effective than either alone. For example, cognitively reframing a situation and then taking a run or doing a breathing exercise would address both the thought and feelings involved in a difficult emotion. There may also be important contextual or personality differences that make one strategy more effective or achievable than another. Now, the key is to know thyself. You have to learn what works best for you in which situations. You have to become aware of the thoughts and feelings that make up an emotion and decide how to move forward. Therapists, coaches, and even good friends can help you do that. But ultimately, it's an individual journey of discovery and iterative improvement. Still, it will always help to remember that an emotion has two basic parts, the cognitive and the interoceptive. Grabbing hold of one or both of these is always the key to finding your way through an emotional challenge. So for me, creating videos like this and doing the research for them has added immensely to my ability to regulate my own emotions, largely because I've learned a ton about the brain and the mind and emotions in general. And I can honestly say that improving my emotion regulation has been the single most important thing, not only for my mental health, but for my overall satisfaction with life. I've heard from many of you who have also gotten something positive out of the videos on this channel, and I'm always thrilled to hear that, even if I'm not always able to respond to everyone. But the truth is that it takes a lot of resources to create these videos. So to be blunt, I need your support. I need your support to keep this channel going in the long run. And if you value the content I create, please become a patron by going to patreon.com slash sense of mind. As a thank you for your support, I provide exclusive content only for patrons at the $5 tier or higher. All right, I know this is a cliche, but for the price of a cup of coffee, you can help me continue my mission of helping people understand their brains and ultimately improve their lives. Regardless, thank you so much for watching this video. I'll catch you next time.